it started at 16 when I was sitting in the local skateboard shop and watched what, skate videos. Rodney Mal, he's, he's my hero and he's still around. And uh, basically what I said is, back then I watched it and participated, was a big fan of this whole culture and learned all, I knew all the tricks. And uh, back then I only thought, okay, it looks cool and I didn't give it much more thought. Then many years later when we were in art school, uh, we happened to bump into uh, Ryochi Kurokawa performance, who's this masterful Japanese uh, multimedia video and sound genius. And he makes live performances. And that was in 2006, I guess, or so. And I kind of discovered the same type of abstract energy that I saw in skateboard videos in those kinds of films again. And I thought, that's what I want to make. It's really that, that was a critical, like a click point. Uh, I think that's what I always found interesting is that over time, when, when you follow that community, whatever it is really, it's, you see the characteristics of everyone kind of coming through more and more through the different uh, pieces he makes and contributes and shows. And uh, then you, you learn more about the personality or what's driving that person. And I think it's just uh, socially almost or on this, on this online social level, it's nice to get to know people and what really drives them and uh, kind of see that as a longer relationship. Um, he, yeah, the, the link to music is, is quite important and it, I think code is in a way a great language to speak both speak to both areas in a way. So I, I was always interested in the visual side, I was always interested in the audio side and code is kind of a tool where we can uh, talk to both. You're not necessarily a master painter or a master sound guy, so it is. it leads to collaboration naturally. So. When, and it's, it's a great glue in a way, great practical glue to p uh, bring the pieces together and also add something new, this whole uh, way of composing stuff in, in real time. I mean, that's another big topic for what we do. Perfect. Contribute. Uh, we try to put our stuff out there, but I'm aware it takes a lot of time and effort. And I'm really thankful for um, Carsten, for example, Carsten Schmidt, who has the writes the toxic lips libraries i haven't used them personally uh, but i've looked them through them many times and always learned new tricks how to do things and they're good references and i think we were talking yesterday about paul paul burke who's kind of a shared uh, guru <laughs> basically uh, and it's basically always the same people in or comes down to the same guys in, in the 80s. Paul Burke, uh, Craig Reynolds, Carl Sims. They are sort of say my, uh, the equivalent to Rodney Mullen in the creative coding world. Um, they've all contributed something that I'm still trying to mimic or trying to learn from. What? But um, I didn't really see where this whole thing was going, to be honest. And at some point, it was some, I think, a Thursday afternoon. We had sliders, we had a graphical nice rendering, and we've written a physics simulation where, which has the three simple flocking rules built in. And at first I thought, okay, yeah, that looks, that looks all right, um, but what's the big deal? It, why did it take us two months to get to this stage? And suddenly when we have found the right values by tweaking them and out of nothing, we had a real living um, flocks basically appearing on screen and we had this one setting and suddenly out of nothing completely new forms would emerge and it would every five minutes there was a new image on the screen that was completely different to what was there before and so this there was this simple step from I knew what we've created was based on relatively simple elements and what came out was something completely far more far more complex than I would have ever imagined. And I think that's the moment where I thought, oh man, we really created some life here. No. Um, there's, there's a nice quote uh, by Will Wright, who's the inventor of uh, SimCity and The Sims and other games, uh, I highly respect. And he said, basically, as a game designer, but I think the same applies to creative coding and these kinds of arts, um, you are sculpting possibility space, which sounds 
big, but in a way that's what it is, is you're adding with those little Lego bricks of code and libraries that you have, you put them together and you add more possibilities. And with every new brick, basically your possibilities increase uh, many times. And that's in a way this adding and taking away, that's kind of the design process now. It's, I still feel in control, uh, but I like to be surprised. I think that's the beauty of it. Um, the, th the thing when the system goes beyond what you naturally understand it to do. And sometimes you have something that surprises you. Uh, and I always look for that, that one moment, basically. We see complexity. I think now we feel that we've kind of explored that area for a bit. And uh, I'm interested to how to um, tell stories again uh, with that. So this whole uh, computational design uh, approach in world tends to look at natural phenomena and tends to be a little bit uh, ambient or abstract. And currently we are in really interested in how can you take that and use it to um, well, t tell stories with people and create films again. I mean, it's interesting because... Uh, the, the working title is Energy Flow at the moment. It's a, uh, a series of 12 short films that we one half produce in-house with a, a crew of uh, up to currently 15 animators across Europe. They're from creature um, animation, rigging specialists, uh, to effects guys, people who can make storms and that kind of stuff. And uh, the other half is where we're commissioning directors and, and guys, friends we trust, uh, to visualize parts of those stories. So the idea is to come up with a, a body of work, um, lots of different scenes, that we can basically cut together and show as an, as an art piece that ever evolves, every iteration will have its your own unique uh, ID, every cut will be different. So uh, that's what we're working on, but it's a long project. <laughs> I mean, But the point, one story, for example, uh, we're trying to illustrate is that moment when last year in summer, suddenly, all of a sudden, out of nothing, the London riots broke out. And so we were sat there directly in the middle. Uh, in our studio, surrounded, suddenly all the shops were closing and I mean, you, we, we thought we were in a civilized country, why is that happening? It was really crazy and for an entire day, we had helicopters over our house, police going through the streets and there was this crazy tension and atmosphere and youths running around the streets. And so one way we're trying to approach it is with, we're using crowd simulations in artificial cities to create these environments where there's a lot of tension in the air and the narrative happens in your head, I guess. So it's the making the connection between different scenes. That's what it is. Um, I think it's probably just a natural development of how things evolve. And uh, so to me and, and other people, it's super interesting to see what's going on, what's, pa what's possible. Uh, that's always interesting to find out new boundaries and explore what's possible in the in the visual realm, what, what are what are the things that we can make now with what we know? And but at the same time, uh, obviously, I think after many years now that we have this creative coding um, revolution or mo movement going on, pe people tend to start to think about what they actually do. So um, the more you make the more interested you become in producing less noise and you want actually to uh, something to make, create some value that, that I think it's, it's the logical next step to move beyond the like borders of our little community. And uh, the logical next step is to be recognized in proper museums and art institutions and bring it, bring it out there basically at any one. So, I'd like to make pieces ideally that my mom would like to see or other people that are between eight and 99 years old. <laughs> so um, yeah, I guess uh, that's maybe the design in me or so who says, I'd like to talk to the widest audience possible, uh, make something that's interesting, but I, to be honest, I guess we're just uh, following our gut feeling. Uh, and there's no, there's no certain, there's not a specific target audience to any of that. I think it's it's hopefully relevant to uh, 
lots of people, uh, but it captures where we are and what we think at this point in time. Mm. Hopefully it will all resolve into one big global conversation where your life is what if you could capture the thinking of a person uh, at one point and then compare it to another point and like a um, really beautiful multi-complex fractal in a way and ideally I'd like to kind of put two next to each other and compare them or talk to them, explore them. And I mean, we, if you look at where we are with our tools uh, that we have available, um, we've got the basic needs covered, the basic uh, input, output, interaction, rendering, that's, that's done. And people don't predict big advances there. There's the limit of our the physical senses is kind of, or the limit of where uh, real and virtual kind of overlaps and meets, uh, that's visible. I mean, uh, Tim Sweeney from Epic Games says that's in 2020, basically. Uh, at that point in time, we'll have graphics cards producing uh, and 3D games engines producing visuals that can fool our eyes believably enough. And so all this extra computation power from then on, hopefully will be spent on uh, developing deeper knowledge systems uh, that can do something like modeling consciousness or um, create more complex, deeper interactions. And I think that's where I'd love cinema to uh, see to go to, where we can play with these virtual actors and we can interact with them on a, on a believable, deeper human level. Maybe I'm concerned about practicality. Uh, it's probably the German in me, but uh, I love all this future stuff. Uh, but I also wonder the question I would ask to the participants is how, maybe I have to rephrase it again, but how can we um, build a, an economy that values contribution, that um, yeah, values contribution and also just work, apl applied work uh, in the same way where people can uh, choose to develop things for the community, but they also can choose to develop things for themselves. And based on that, there's a, I think we need a fluid way of transaction of where this one thing is equally valued to another. Um, and how can we make that work? I guess is what I'm, what I'm asking. Um, many years later, when we were in art school, uh, we happened to bump into uh, Ryochi Kurokawa performance, who's this masterful Japanese uh, multimedia video and sound genius. And he makes live performances. And that was in 2006, I guess, or so. And I kind of discovered the same type of abstract energy that I saw in skateboard videos in those kinds of films again. And I thought, that's what I want to make. It's really, that, that was a critical, like a click point. And, and so in a way we've kind of looked away and in nights with beers and cigarettes, jamming in the art, art school, uh, we played a lot on electronic uh, music instruments. Ableton Live was just out and it was a big, uh, big thing. And so I kind of realized I wanted to make, I'm, I'm I didn't have the patience, basically, to build static things and craft them until they're finally there. And it's not really what we want to do. So we essentially, we still like to capture that spirit and that energy that comes with the uh, synchronous um, happening of sound and image. And there's so many different ways to do it, to show it, to explore it. And that's kind of what drives us. That's one of the other. Um, I think there's two ways to explore it. There's, for one, um, I really, that kind of relates back to, let's say, my early education in creative coding, which was in processing alpha, uh, beta days, and uh, that, that kind of time when I looked up to the big guys, so to say, and, and learned lots of tricks from them simply by looking through their code. And uh, also there was this whole really vibrant vibe uh, online around. Um, 
of lots of guys showing little new snippets and I think that was an interesting uh, um, time basically for several years until I think there was a certain point of uh, satisfaction reached where everyone's kind of tried out everything and at least the obvious areas and then mo moved on to uh, apply to bigger bigger projects. Um, but um, you are sculpting possibility space, which sounds big, but in a way that's what it is. is you're adding with those little Lego bricks of code and libraries that you have, you put them together and you add more possibilities. And with every new brick, basically your possibilities increase uh, many times. And that's in a way this adding and taking away, that's kind of the design process now. It's, I still feel in control, uh, but I like to be surprised. I think that's the beauty of it. Um, the, th the thing when the system goes beyond what you naturally understand it to do, and sometimes you have something that surprises you. Uh, and I always look for that, that one moment, basically. We see complexity. It basically was that. I think at the moment, uh, with all the, the complexities of the media landscape, um, you can't, uh, you can't plan or you can't devise your films as a 90 minute thing anymore. Uh, you need to have many different entry points. You need to be able to recombine uh, different aspects of the story or make it longer or shorter, deeper. And I think that's where, something where code, again, uh, is an interesting tool, basically for filmmakers or for storytelling. So that's, that's really lovely.